Good morning, uh, Chem305. Um, bear with me one second while I set up. Set up all my streams. Oh, hey. Oh, good morning. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. No, no worries. Albin, what's up? Carolyn, I'm so glad you asked. Um, do you know what's good today is, um, is, uh, whoa, there we go. Um, dude, what's good today is our mixtape. Um, if you all have never um, listened to or heard of um, Tom Waits, uh, you are going to want to check out our daily mixtape today. Um, if, if, if I had to, if I were stranded on an island and I could only pick one artist to listen to for the rest of my life, it would be him. Um, hands down. He, um, has, oh, let's see. Heck yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah, anyways, check out the Daily Mixtape if you've never heard of, uh, Tom Waits. Karenessa, um, let's see. Uh, you totally, let's see. Is it okay if we ask questions at the end of the lecture about homework other things? Should we wait tomorrow in office hours? Okay, so um, so here's the thing. Um, Karen, you totally can um, ask questions um, at the end of lecture. Um, however, uh, my ability... Let's see. Um, to answer them um, will uh, will change say uh, day to day. Um, there are some days where I am a little more free. There are some days where I have um, I have to like when my wife's working and I have to go uh, wake a baby up from his nap, etc. So. Um, so my ability to answer questions will be different. Uh, sorry, answer questions at the end of lecture will be different every day. Um, I'm always available to do them in office hours. It's another reason why um, I know summer session moves fast. Um, why we're doing six hours of office hours each week. Um, if you can't make the office hours, um, you can always email your questions in and I will uh, go over them. Um, but totally, totally. I, I might, depending upon the length of the questions, I might have to split. Um, and maybe I'll like roll it over and say, hey, I'll, I'll answer this in uh, office hours. Oh my gosh, Brianna, that is an amazing emoji. That is an amazing emoji. I've never seen it before. Um, If you'll share the uh, the wisdom, I'm sure we'd all appreciate it. Um, so, business or uh, items of business mixtape. Tom Waits, check it out. You won't be disappointed. He's weird. He's weird, but good. Um, another thing, if you're noticing that um, the camera angle's a little bit different, I was I was listening to the. Um, Actually, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's disappearing into the box. Um, it reminds me of Schrodinger's cat, the emoji that's going on in the uh, live chat. Um, if you've noticed a little bit difference in the camera, I'm trying a different mount setup. I, um, in the previous couple days, I actually had it mounted onto my um, onto my mic uh, setup, but um, but I was time stamping the videos, like re-listening to them, and I was noticing... I've noticed 
for both of our lectures and then our office hours, there's this like very subtle like tinny feedback thing, and so I'm I'm testing a different. I have it mounted on um, something else. It's still kind of close to the mic. I don't. They shouldn't be creating feedback because I have the mic removed. Um, or sorry, the, the mic should be the only audio feed, but maybe it's making some feedback with the mic. So anyways, um, I'm giving that a whirl. It, it was weird because it was feedback that wasn't showing up in my headphones, and so I only heard it when I re-listened. Um, oh, gotcha. All right, so this is, a, this is a public service announcement. If you want to use Brianna's awesome emojis, they're, they're YouTube-only emojis. Um, which YouTube has some of the best emojis out there. Um, it's where you get this dabbing guy, who's my personal favorite. Um, okay, pieces of business. So, so if you notice the difference in the mic, we're testing that out. We're, I'm going to figure it out so that we don't have any feedback in the videos. Um, my apologies for that being in the early two. Um... As you all know, hopefully you saw my, uh, my, um, what's that thing called? My post. I posted an announcement yesterday. Um, almost everybody turned in their, um, their syllabus quizzes. Uh, some humans were dropped. Um, and then the waitlisted students, um, as many as I could received ad codes. Now, if you are waitlisted um, and you received an ad code, um, this is this is just for you, for those of you who haven't enrolled yet. Um, the, uh, the last day to add is Saturday. All right, this is a hard and fast date. Um, if you're not, if you do not add, if you procrastinate, don't add to the class, um, you will not be able to take chem this summer. So you've got an ad code, um, use it ASAP. I would recommend doing it before 613, right? Because that's Saturday. Um, if there's some trouble with e-services, um, nobody's gonna be in the office to help you. So I would just do it ASAP. If you've got an ad code, use it, get on Canvas. Um, the sooner the better and safer. Okay, Susan, you got a question. Looking for homework chapter one and two on Canvas. 30 minutes. Um, okay, that's a surprise to me. Susan, question. Um, um, question are you talking about the lab one plus two quiz because the lab quiz um, is timed but the um, the homework should not be so I'm looking so there's homework one and then there's lab quiz one plus two Let me take a look. Homework one should not be timed. Let me see. I'm checking out homework one. Weird. Okay, okay, hang on, hang on. That should not be the case. Um everyone okay, let me let me take a look in here. It says homework chapter one through two, 30 minute time limits. Um, let me go to assignments. Prereq exam. Homework one. Ooh. 
Let's see, homework one, chapters one and two. Yeah, so, so uh, Susan, I just opened up the, um, the settings and it said it shouldn't have a time limit. So, um, so it's showing um, no time limit on my end. Um, here's what I would do. Try opening it up um, and going in there. And if you see there's a timer, um, after, after lecture, like roll in there, open it up. Try taking it. it. It shouldn't have a timer. It should just have a due date. And um, if you're still seeing a um, a timer, shoot me an email and um, and I will figure the situation out and I'll get rid of it. You don't have to worry about it going away. Um, here's the thing: the lab quiz one plus two is timed thirty minutes. All right. So for lab quiz one and two, that's a thirty minute timer. Homework one. Um, should not have a timer on it, and it's not reflecting one on um, on my end. So um, give that a whir uh, whirl, uh, check that out after lecture, and I will um, correct it if it's wrong. All right, let's. Okay, yeah, that is odd. Um, Okay, let's close that up. Oh, I see no time limit, but just refresh the page on my page on my phone. Okay, so I don't know. Canvas is um, weird. Maybe it's updated for some students and not for others. Um, it's possible. Um, it's 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 um, bewildering though. Not gonna lie. Um, All right, let's see. Okay, right, so let's um, let's go ahead and dive into some new uh, lecture material. And where we left off on things, we had just, um, just barely introduced sig figs, right? Um, basically, to, to the extent of me telling you how important um, they were, um, that this is something that um, I'll test on regularly, and um, and you definitely need to master if you don't want to um, bleed points. All right. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah no, no, I'll, I'll leave that for later. Okay. So let's start w by talking about first when we talk about significant figures. Uh, I'm going to get the to their origin story. Um, eventually, we'll talk about where they come from, why uh, they're significant, why they're important um, in a bit. But for now, um, before we get to the where they come from and why they are, we're going to talk about what they are. All right, we're going to talk about um, identifying oops, identifying significant figures. Um, and just to let you know, um, throughout this lecture, I am going to switch off between saying um, significant figures and significant digits. They are um, they are the same thing. All right. So, what digits are significant? First, when you're looking at a number, when you're looking at a number, um, you should know that all non-zero digits are significant. All right, all non-zero digits are significant. So if I were to give you the number um, 12 and ask you how many significant digits or significant figures are in this number, we have one, two non-zero digits, so this would have two sig figs, all right? Um, if I were to give you the number um, 
469.7, this number has one, two, three, four non-zero digits. So that means that we have four significant figures in this number, all right? So all of your, all non-zero digits appearing in a number are significant. All right, two. This raises the question, can zeros be significant? And they can under two circumstances. First, um, all zeros that are between between significant figures are significant. All right, so the number 101 has two non-zero digits, all right? But then it has one zero that's between significant digits. So that means that 101 has three sig figs. All right, um, the number one hundred thousand and ten has two non zero digits, and then it has three zeros that are between significant digits. So those three zeros become significant. That last zero on the end is not between significant digits, so it is not significant. So 100,010 has five significant figures. Cool? All right, now, third. Um, there's one other instance where a zero can be significant. So a zero that is both at the end of a number and to the right of the decimal. Is significant. All right. Now this one is the easiest one to mess up because often students just remember to the right of the decimal. But you have to remember it's both at the end of the number and to the right of the decimal. So for example, let's look at how many significant, significant digits are in this number. All right, so first we have two non-zero digits. All right, looking at rule number two, there's no zeros in between significant digits, um, but we also have a zero that is both to the right of the decimal and at the end of the number. You'll notice that this zero, even though it is to the right of the decimal is not at the end of the number, so it doesn't qualify for rule three. Only that last zero meets both of these uh, criteria. And so the number 0 0.0560 has three significant digits. All right, let's take a look. At this number. Point one zero 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 zero. All right, we have one non-zero digit. All right, that is our first one. We have a zero that's both to the right of the decimal and at the end of the number, right? So that last zero. And then you'll notice because that one is significant and that last zero is significant, you have one, two, three, four, five zeros that are in between those two significant digits. So this number has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven significant figures in it. Cool? 
All right, these are the rules for identifying how many significant digits are in your number, all right? Um, you wanna know these rules cold. Um, there's definitely problems um, in the homework and there will be problems on uh, future exams. Almost every problem with math that you do in this class, you'll have to keep track of significant digits. So, um, so I recommend becoming very, very, very comfortable uh, with, uh, with identifying them, all right? Because you'll need to for all the math that we do in this class. All right, that's how you identify significant digits. Now, I want to take a minute and talk about um, where these things come from, all right? Now that we know how to identify significant digits, why are we um, obsessing about them? And the reason why uh, significant digits are important in chemistry um, is that uh, significant figures um, are created by taking measurements. All right, they come from taking measurements. The reason why you've never heard about significant figures, significant digits in your math classes is because mathematicians, pure mathematicians, don't measure anything. All right, it's all conceptual, it's all theoretical, it's pure logic, but it's not out in the real world where you're measuring how long something is or how big something is. It's a purely rational theoretical coordinate plane, right? Significant digits come from taking measurements. So for example, Let's say we have a ruler here. All right, um, we'll say this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is in, uh, we'll say centimeters. All right, um, and let's say we want to measure a string And the string is, I'm gonna shorten it a little bit, this long, all right? And uh, let's say that we wanna measure this string. We wanna know how long is it? Well, you, you line it up with your ruler, right? And you see, where does this cross my ruler? And you can see that it falls between four and five centimeters. Now, if you were to say, that this string was four centimeters long. Um, that would be incorrect, right? Because we can see that it's longer than four centimeters. We know it's longer. All right? Uh, if, okay, so what's longer than four? Well, five is. If you were to say that this string is five centimeters long, this would also be incorrect because we know, we can see, that this string is shorter than five centimeters. The problem comes with, okay, well we know it's longer than four, shorter than five, so what is this? Is it four and a half? You're like, well, it, it looks a little shorter than four and a half. Does that mean it's 4.4 .4 or 4.3? How long is this, right? Is this string, is it 4.5? Oh, let's see. I need to make some room here. Let's bump this down a little bit. So what is this thing? Is it, oops, there we go. Is it 4.5, 4.4? Four point three centimeters, which is it? And with this ruler, we actually have no way of knowing, right? There are no markings in between four and five, so we don't have any way to tell how long this string actually is. So we have to take our best guess 
And the reality is, each one of these answers could be correct because if I say this looks like it's 4.3 centimeters and you say it looks like 4.4, neither of us have any way to prove that the other's wrong and that we're correct, all right? So the answer here is you could pick any one of these. I'm gonna say that this is 4.3 centimeters long, all right? Now this last digit in the number is uncertain. All right, it's uncertain because again, we don't have markings, we don't know how long that actually is. But, so we're taking our best guess. It's called the uncertain digit. All right, and this is the best measurement we can make with the ruler at hand. Now, let's say we wanna measure the same string using a different ruler. Still centimeters. But let's say with this ruler that it's measured Ooh, hang on. Let me see, I gotta do better. Gotta be a little more accurate. All right, now let's measure this, uh, the length of this string with our new ruler. Now with this one, the difference is these are all marked not to the ones place, but the tenths place, right? So when we line this up, it hits exactly at 4.4 4 centimeters, all right? It's 4.4, and because we can see with this marking that it's dead on, we call this 4.40. Because no matter what you're measuring with, you always measure to one place beyond the last marking on the ruler. So here, in our first measurement, our uncertain digit was in the tenths place, but now on this second ruler, because we have markings in the tenths place, the uncertain digit is in the hundredths place. All right? So with the first ruler, our measurement was 4.3. With our second ruler, the measurement came out to be 4.4. Zero. All right. Now let's compare these two measurements 4.40 centimeters versus 4.3 centimeters. All right. Now, if I were to ask you how many significant digits are in 4.3 centimeters, well, we have two non zero digits. So we have two significant figures. When you look at the other, number 4.40, two non-zero digits, and we have a zero that's both to the right of the decimal and at the end of the number. So this number has three significant digits. It has three significant digits because it was that measurement was taken on a device that's more precise. Right? The first ruler didn't have any markings in between the one centimeter mark, just the one centimeter mark was the last marking. So we got a measurement that only had two significant figures. But the second one, that ruler had markings, 10 markings in between each centimeter. So it was a more precise instrument and it gave us a more precise measurement. So we see that this number is precise, more precise, because it has 
more sig figs. All right. That's why significant digits are important in this class because they reflect the precision, the exactness of the device used to take the measurement. All right, the more precise the device, the more significant digits you'll have in your measurement. Does that make sense? Let me know if you guys have any questions on that. That is where they come from. Numbers that are not measured do not have any significant digits. All right, they only come from taking, um, taking measurements. All right, now, um, I wanna say something about taking measurements. Um, so, just to summarize, awesome. Awesome, Jen, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, now, just to sum things up, the last, uh, I should say, digit. The last digit in a number Or I should say, in a measurement. Um, is called the uncertain digit. All right. Um, it's called the uncertain digit. Now, the uncertain digit um, it is always one space beyond the last marking on the um, measuring device, whatever you're using, whether it's a thermometer or a graduated cylinder, it's always one space beyond the last marking on the measuring device. So wherever that last marking lies, you're always going to guess what the next one is. And if it's exactly on a line, you just add a zero like we did in the previous example. All right, so you always are gonna add one. When you're measuring with analog devices, like a normal thermometer or um, a graduated cylinder, something that should be said though, and this is an important note, um, because for example, in the lab videos, oftentimes you'll be writing down numbers um, that, uh, like for example, masses that people, that the faculty at FLC have uh, weighed out on a digital scale. Um, so you, um, so when you're using a digital scale, you never add, um, never add digits or round, or round off um, um, measurements from a digital display. Um, whatever that is. Sometimes you may use a, um, a digital thermometer, for example. Um, when you use a digital thermometer or a digital mass scale, those numbers that you see on the readout have already taken to account, into account and added the uncertain digit for you. So you never add a number to that. You also never round them off. Use all the numbers um, available to you on the display. All right, so whenever you're doing analog, 
like measuring with a ruler, measuring with a graduated cylinder, um, a thermometer that has a little colored liquid inside. You always add one space beyond the markings, one uh, digit. But then if you're using digital, you just use the number as is. Cool? Okay, now, um, recording measurements with the proper number of significant figures, super important. Um, being able to identify how many significant digits are in a number, also very important. But where the reason why this is important and we need to keep track of these is when we use measured numbers in mathematical calculations, we also need to keep track of our significant figures. And how you do that um, depends upon what mathematical operation you're doing, okay? So this is where honestly significant digits become more challenging, is keeping track of them throughout the course of um, mathematical operations. Okay, let's see. Um, Brianna, for labs, is anyone having a bit of the problem reading volume? This is going to sound constantly. Ah! Um. Um, okay, so let's talk about um, using significant figures um, with addition and subtraction. All right, how do you keep track of significant digits when you are adding and subtracting numbers? All right, so here's the rule. Um, when you're adding and subtracting, the answers, your answer's precision must be the same as the least precise um, measurement used in the calculation. So when you're adding and subtracting, your answer's precision must be the same as the least precise measurement used in the calculation. All right, so what are we talking about? Well, first, let's talk about precision. We, we, we talked a little bit about it when we were looking at those two different rulers, right? We could see that the one ruler was more precise um, because it had more uh, smaller little markings than the other ruler. But when we talk about the precision of a number, um, we're talking about the last significant digit in the number. So the further uh, the further, sorry, to the left, 
sorry, not to the left, to the right. A little dyslexic here. Um, the birth is to the right, the last, um, here, hang on one second. Sorry, give me one second. Hello? Yo, sorry for dipping. Um, there's a uh, phone call from the doctor's office, um, but it was just a, an appointment reminder. Um, okay, I apologize for ghosting. I'm back now. So the further to the right, the um, last um, significant figure uh, is in a number. Um, the more precise that number is. All right, so we need to get good at spotting uh, precision in a number before we can um, uh, before we can add and subtract because we need to be able to look at two numbers and know which one is more precise. So, with that in mind, let's identify which number is more precise. So first, is 1.01 .01 more precise or a le or a 10 point one. Now remember, with precision, we're looking at the last decimal place in the number. All right. So in 1.01, .01, the la or not sorry, not the last decimal place. That's the trip. That's the trip up. The last. Where is the last significant digit in the number? In 1.01, .01, it's in the hundredth hundredths place. In 10.1, it's in the tenths place. Whichever one is furthest to the right is more precise, so that means that 1.01 .01 is more precise than 10.1. Let's do another example. 0 0.0067 versus 0 0 0.00670. Well, when you look at the last two, or the last significant digit in each number, the first one has its last significant digit in the fourth decimal place. The second one has its last one in the fifth. Even though the numbers have the same value, 6.00670 is more precise. All right. Now, at this point, you may be thinking like, oh, it's just look at whichever one has more decimal places. If that's the case, how do you do How do you determine which of the following is more precise? One thousand one hundred versus one thousand and ten. Neither of these numbers have any decimal places, so if you're only looking at decimals, you'll have trouble identifying which one of these numbers is more precise. But if you remember that it's just the last significant digit in the number, you can see that one thousand and ten has its last significant digit further to the right than 1,100, and therefore it is more precise, all right? Now, now that we kind of have a handle on precision, let's start applying the rules for addition and subtraction of significant figures. Our answer must be the same as the least precise measurement used in the calculation, all right? So let's add All right, let's add 34 plus 3.5. All right, you punch this into your calculator. Your calculator will tell you that the answer is 37.5, and that is the correct value. 
but every time you add numbers together in this class, all right, every time you need to ask yourself, what, how many significant figures should my answer have? And the rules for addition and subtraction is the precision of our answer must be equal to the um, precision of our least precise number we used in the calculation. 34 is precise to the ones place. 3.5 is precise to the tenths place. So 34 is less precise, which means our answer must have its last significant digit in the ones place, and 37.5 does not, all right? Because the answer must have its last significant digit in the ones place, we need to round, and five is gonna round up. So our correct value with the correct number of significant figures will be 38. All right, we have our last significant digit in the ones place. Let's do another example. Let's do um, let's do an upsetting example. Now let's not do the upsetting one yet. Let's do um, All right, let's add these two together. Again, you punch it into your calculator. Your calculator will tell you that the answer is 1.6921, all right? Ah, okay, Angela, great question. Um, okay, Parthana, I will get to your question in just one second first. Angela, um, you can, um, in this case, it uh, does not affect the answer. All right. Um, okay, Karen, I'll answer your question in just one second. First, Prarthana. Um, so, Prarthana's question is, I'm just gonna scoot this over so we have a little more room. Um, so, when you look at um, 37, oops, uh, 37.5, all right, you'll agree with me that we have to round to the ones place, all right? And five, so you look at one space over, five rounds up. So five, when you round it up, makes that seven become an eight, and that is why 38 um, is the answer. So, oops. So the, the answer is five or greater always rounds up, four or less always rounds down. Um, I know they tried to change, um, some people tried to change the rules for rounding um, a little while ago, but this was categorically rejected by the scientific community. Um, and nobody does the weird new ways where five rounds up or down half of the time. Um, so it's it's just five always rounds up, five and greater rounds up, four or lower rounds down. All right, um, totally, totally, yeah. Because there was like, they tried to replace it with this confusing thing, so five would go up or down half of the time. Um, but that was n never actually, it, it's funny, it wasn't actually put forth by scientists and it was like rejected across the board like everybody chemists physicists engineers biologists we all agreed that that was garbage so so yeah so so it makes the rules easy again five always rounds up okay um karenessa okay let's see um what if we get the wrong calculation based on the numbers we recorded um for the lab so um So 
So, um, Karen, has a, when I grade the lab, um, I am looking for two things. One, um, is it complete? In other words, did you fill out the entire exercise? Um, and two, the second thing that I'm looking for is, did you do um, all the correct algebraic steps? If you did both one and two, you get full credit. So that's how I grade the lab. I'm, I'm not looking for um, is the answer correct because part of it is based on ob like personal observation. So like the numbers may be slightly different, um, but if you do it completely, you fill out every part of the exercise. Um, and you uh, do all the correct algebraic steps, your math looks good, you're gonna get full credit. Um, where I start grading on right versus wrong is in the lab quizzes, all right? So the lab exercises, just complete this. Did you do the work? Did you do all the steps correct? Um, but then in the quizzes that are through Canvas, that's where you need to get the right answer. And the reason why I grade like that in Canvas is because I create the numbers. So I know that everybody's gonna get the same number because I give you the same number. So hopefully hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay, let's see, where are we? 213. Let's, um, let's look at uh, this example that we've, we've uh, shoved to the side for a little bit here. So our first number has its last significant digit in the fourth decimal place. Our second number, 1.6, has its last significant digit in the first decimal place, the tenths. We need to round to the tenths. Um, and then um, when we do, nine rounds up. Right, it rounds up. So that 1.6 will become a 1.7. That is the correct value with the correct number of sig figs, all right? Um, now let's do one more upsetting example. Let's add 30, let's take the sum of 30 and three. You punch this into your calculator, or maybe if you're smart, you do it in your head, and you get the answer 30 plus three is 33. Let's apply the rules for sig figs. 30 is precise to the tens place. Three is precise to the ones place. So our answer has to have its last significant digit in the ones place. And three, because it's less than five, will round down. So the sum of 30 and three is 30. All right, and this is deeply upsetting. Um, this is where a lot of students go, significant figures are garbage, they're nonsense, because 30 plus 3 does not equal 30. 30 plus 3 is equal to 33, but when I apply the rules for sig figs, I get the answer of 30 here. All right, now. Sig figs are not garbage, and here's why. The reason why the answer is 30 is because this guy up here is imprecise. No, no, no. <laughs> Jen is booing. Um, but, but, but bear with me. 30, the number 30 is imprecise. That measurement, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um,
let's see. This is that thing where I'm looking for just the right emoji. Um. Yeah. Oh, you totally will. But 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 track with me. The number thirty is imprecise. If you want to add thirty and three, and have the answer be thirty three, then you need to use. A better instrument. Right, the number 30 has its last significant digit in the tens place because that is where, um, that's the uncertain digit, right? That's the uncertain digit. And so when you add 30.0, for example, to 3, the correct value is 33. When we look at the last significant digit, for each, 30.0 has its last significant digit in the tenths place, 3 has its last significant digit in the ones place, therefore the answer must have its last significant digit in the ones place, and it does. So 33 is the answer. Yeah, 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 totally, 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 I highly... Um, checking out this section in the book. Um, the first time you see significant figures, the first time you're forced to use them, it feels all wrong and it feels hard and impossible. Um, and that's going to be your first exposure. But the more repetition you get, the more second nature this will become. And you want a lot of repetition. You want this to be second nature because we're going to be doing this for the end of the semester. And you're going to need to be able to, even in multiple choice problems, you're going to need to be able to select the correct answer that has the right number of sig figs because often I'll put the same value but with different amounts of sig figs and you'll need to know based on the calculation you just did how many sig figs your answer should have. Um, yeah, totally. And, and, and... I want to echo, echo um, Karenessa right here. You want to do a ton of practice problems. Ah! Does the zero after the decimal count as a significant figure? Susan, it does because it is both um, to the right of the decimal and, all right, this is a cru crucial, and it's to the right of the decimal and at the end of the number. That's what makes it significant, to the right of the decimal and at the end of the number. All right? Okay. Those are the rules for um, adding and subtracting. Um, let's talk about the rules for multiplication and division. Alright, fortunately, the rules for multiplication and division are actually easier um, than uh, addition and subtraction. Oh, Susan, let me see. So, 3 only has one sig fig. Ah, ah, Susan, great question. For, um... For addition and subtraction, um, you don't look at the quantity of sig figs. 
you look at each number's precision. Which is another way of saying the last in each number. Yeah, okay, the rule for multiplication and division is a little more straightforward than addition and subtraction. Here, oops. So the rule for multiplication and division is as follows. The number of sig figs in your answer Um, must be the same as the measurement with the least sig figs that you used in the calculation. All right, so with addition and subtraction, you look at the precision. With multiplication and division, you look at the, um, the number of sig figs. So for example, Let's do 101 times, ooh, hang on. Yeah, let's just, well, okay, yeah, we'll start here. Let's do 101 times three, all right? 101 times 3 is 303. Now, 101 has two non-zero digits and then a zero in between, so it has three sig figs. But 3 only has one, and because we're multiplying, our answer can only have one significant digit, all right? Zero is going to round down, so 300 is our answer. Let's do another example. Let's do 101 times 3.00. 0. Now our value here is the same. 3.00 times 101 is 303. We already know that 101 has three significant digits, but turns out that 3.00, we have one non-zero digit, we have a zero that is both to the right of the decimal and at the end of the number, so that's significant, and then we have a zero trapped between those two. Since both of these numbers have three significant digits, our answer must have three significant digits, and 303 does. So 303 is the correct answer for this multiplication. Let's do another example. 101 times 3.0. Right again. The correct value is 303. 101 has three significant digits, but 3.0 only has two. So our answer needs two sig figs. The problem is 300 has one sig fig, 303 has three sig figs. How do you write 300? Well, yeah, essentially we need two sig figs right in our number. But the problem is this three will round down. How do we, whoa, um, how do we write the correct answer with the right number of sig figs. When, once you round, 
3 is going to round down. So once you round, the answer is 300, but 300 only has, or one sig fig. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to, Jen, you are, you are on the right track. Um, the problem is, if we did 300.0, we would have four sig figs. So that's even more. How do we write this with two? And the answer is you have to use something called scientific notation. If you were to write 300 in scientific notation, oops, it would be 3 times 10 to the squared, right? Because you take that decimal and you roll it over one, two spots. You put the decimal right after the first non-zero digit in your number. And then you add a zero. This, 3.0 times 10 to the squared has 10 to the second power has two significant digits. In scientific notation, the 10 times 10 to the whatever power um, contributes no significant figures to your number. All right, so you have to use scientific notation in this instance to um, write the correct value with the correct number of sig figs. Um, so we are, um, we're running a little, not low on time, we're, we're, we're at the end of, um, of our lecture today. We're going to, we'll, so we'll pick up tomorrow, we'll talk more about scientific notation, we'll do more examples of using, applying the rules for sig figs in mathematical operations. Um, here's what I would recommend, um, my personal recommendation. Um, to you is um, hit the uh, the chapter two um, practice um, practice homework. Hit that hard. Start doing a lot of these sig fig problems. Um, until it becomes comfortable. The ones that you don't understand, um, that that you're struggling with, um, bring those to office hours or email them if you can't make office hours live um, so you can get the explanations for those. And um, you want to start getting this in your brain. You want to start changing the way you think because for the next eight weeks, um, every math problem that you do, you're going to need to apply the rules um, for, uh, for significant figures. So this is, you want this to become um, as natural as breathing. Um, so I would start, I would start, uh, start doing that as soon as possible. Um, also, so um, one last, one last thing before we, we put a, a formal, formal pin. Um, uh, everyone who's currently in the class completed the, uh, the syllabus quiz and I got actually a lot of questions um, about where I fall on the uh, the classic um, beans versus robots um, and and this was uh, a very very close margin some were uh, not even close um, some there was definitely a, a high um, the class showed a, a, an affinity for one over the other, um, but beans versus robots um, ended up coming out to uh, to sixty one percent voted beans and um, thirty nine um, percent voted uh, voted robots. And if you're wondering at where I land um, on this issue. Um, it, like, honestly, I, I mean, I really love both. Um, as you can see, I, um, I've, like, 
The, there's there's a robot. Shoot, there's even a robot like where like right here um, in our title screen. But if I had to pick one over the other, um, I think I would have to go with beans. So, anyways, that's the answer to that question. Um, I have opinions on everything else as well, but um, we don't have to waste our lecture time on uh, on that. Um, okay, that being said, so that's that's official um, close of lecture. I, I remember someone asked if I could answer a homework question um, at the beginning. Oh, okay, it was Karenessa. Um, we do, I do have uh, a few minutes. Um, So uh, what was your homework you? Because we can uh, get into it. I've been hiding this all lecture. And you can if you if you rewatch it and you go back, you'll notice that every time I take a sip, it was like this. Because um because I was saving that reveal till uh, till the end. Because I'm a sly, sly bean enthusiast. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Um, oh, decomposition. Oh, yeah. Okay. Ah, yes, yes, totally, totally. I, I, Karenessa, I think your, um, your, uh, your question, I think I understand your question. Correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but your, your question is one, um, about, uh, decomposition. Um, ah, in a, okay, 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 totally. Okay, great. Great question. Um, so you're you're so you're wondering about decomposition in the context of chemical change and physical change. All right. And decomposition is a um, it is a uh, a process that and there's multiple different ways this can happen, um, but in general, it's a process that breaks. a molecule down into smaller um, pieces. So for example, um, a decomposition uh, reaction um, could be uh, if, if if you've ever seen one of those things where they put like a uh, like a beaker of water and then a battery underneath and then two test tubes and bubbles start forming um, at the two nodes of the nine volt battery and they start bubbling. That is the decomposition of water. That's taking H two O, which is a liquid, and breaking it down into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. All right, so this is an example of a decomposition. Um, another very common decomposition is uh, hydrogen peroxide will decompose into um, into water, which is a liquid, and oxygen gas. So it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to break all the way down into each individual element. Um, as you can see with the decomposition of water, it breaks into an element and another element. Um, in the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, it breaks into an element um, and a, uh, another compound, right? Water is not an element, water is a compound. But in bo both of these are decompositions because they both take a molecule and break them down into smaller pieces. So decomposition, 
as you can see, is changing the chemical structure. It's changing the composition. It's taking a molecule and breaking it into other stuff. So a decomposition is um, definitely um, an example of chemical change. All right. Um, ah, okay. Um, Jen, so so the example of ice melting. So let's 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 look at that. If we look at ice melting. All right. We have a um So I'm going to draw a beaker, and in this beaker, we have an ice cube. And it's gonna melt. It's gonna go from being that solid block of ice into, you know, a liquid. Now, before the ice melts, ice is solid water, right? It's solid H2O, stacking. on top of itself, it's water before it melts. When ice melts, it becomes a liquid. It's water after it melts. So because the chemical structure has not changed, it's water when it's ice, it's water when it's water, um, we say that ice melting is an example of physical change. Does that make sense? So if the structure, the chemical structure is the same before and after, the change is physical. If the chemical structures have changed in the process, that is an example of chemical change. Cool? Alrighty. So um, I think that's where I'm going to uh, to call uh, lecture for today. Um, hopefully, I'll see everyone back same time um, tomorrow. And oh, okay, awesome, awesome. Also tomorrow, um, we have our second round of office hours. If you did not uh, tune in for office hours yesterday, they were awesome. Uh, I thought. I thought the discussion was great, um, stimulating. Um, it uh, it was a really, um, really productive time. Um, so, so drop by tomorrow. If you can't make it tomorrow, then um, email in your question. If you're like, it's homework problem eight, put... Chem 300 office hours in the uh, subject line of your email and uh, include a picture of the problem so that I, I have it for context. Okay, we got a couple other questions. When taking chemical structure, when talking chemical structure changes, I immediately think of diamond slash jewels. You are on the right path. No, 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 no. Jen, that is totally spot on. Oops. Um, uh, diamonds are carbon. Coal is carbon, right? Your pencil lead is carbon. But they have very different structures. That's what makes coal smudgy and gross, and that's what makes diamonds hard and beautiful. Um, so that is totally a spot-on way of thinking of things. Karenessa, let's see. So if a solid melts at a certain temperature, then decomposes. Ah! Karenessa, that is an interesting situation. Um, that's actually two things rolled into one. Um, the melting is a physical change.
and the decomposition is a chemical change. Um, so it's a physical change. If something melts and then decomposes, it's a physical change followed by a, um, a chemical change. Alrighty. Dudes, thanks for, as always, for, um, for rolling, uh, with me this morning and hanging out. Um, I, uh, sorry, I just totally drew a blank. Um, it was a great lecture. Looking forward to seeing everyone tomorrow in lecture and in office hours. Cheers.